It's 4 p.m. on D-Day, and the 17th hour of the day begins. The fight has moved beyond the beaches for the most part, but it is still very much a fight. Sure is. And this hour, over to the east, there are stubborn German defenses and the first organized German counterattack. The struggle to break into and overcome the Hillman position continues unabated. The infantry has finally at least breached the center position, though. They're attacking the steel cupolas with 17-pounder anti-tank guns, but the shells do virtually no damage. The Germans are underground here, snug in their bunkers, but they've been laying down a lot of small arms fire that's really hurting the British. One by one, the Suffolks knocked out the anti-tank guns and eliminated a good number of the surface machine gun pits. But fire continued to come at them from all directions and from every dip in the ground. Tanks arrived and joined in the action, enabling the infantry to close on the trench systems. But it was a slow process to overcome each infantryman in his well-concealed hiding place. The KSLI, have been heading for Caen, but at Beauville they get held up by snipers in the church tower. They take care of them, but this brings out an issue among the men. See, the snipers have been taking out NCOs mainly, like, like hunting them. So some of the other ones cut their rank identifying stripes off their uniforms. This is a divisive issue, however, since some commanders are cool with it happening, and others do not allow it and insist on rank being worn. By now, Staffordshire Yeomanry has caught up with the KSLI, and they're deploying around both Beauville and Beville, not that far from Caen. It's not just the Yeomanry. I mean, they already had some self-propelled artillery from the 7th Field Regiment. But then, the 33rd Field Regiment turned up. Then the 41st anti-tank battery arrived, then a heavy machine gun platoon from 2nd Middlesex Regiment. So suddenly, there is a real force here. But K.P. Smith is thinking, like Rennie, more and more about defense and not hitting Kant. On the right, W Company of KSLI has moved on to Perrier Ridge. They head up the left of the ridge to the right of the fighting for Hillman, and on the back slope of the ridge meet the enemy, a German artillery battery and artillery battalion headquarters. This is WN-21A, which has four 122mm formerly Soviet guns in open positions, but surrounded by barbed wire. Like Morris, it's mainly manned by Poles. The following firefight is pretty intense, but backed by armor, the Shropshires win the day. After this, though, KSLI Commander Morris thinks his right flank is kinda exposed, so he leaves a squad of armor on the ridge to protect the approach to the 185th, and then continues to slowly advance on Caen. German 352nd Division Commander Dietrich Kreis is aware of the growing gap in his Mauvain front, and he sent Kampfgruppe Meyer to plug that gap. Now, we saw them get that order hours ago at Omaha and head over on bicycles. Well, also some commandeered French trucks. They have been delayed by both naval gunfire and aerial bombardment, but they arrive on the scene around 4 p.m. They also have 10 Stug assault guns with them by now. But they run into elements of the 5th East Yorks and the 4th 7th Dragoon Guards. The Yorks have just captured villiers le sec after two hours of fighting. The fight now does not go well for Kampfgruppe Meyer. Meyer is killed and most of the Kampfgruppe destroyed. Under air attack and harried by the fleet, never mind Allied ground troops, very few grenadiers appear to have survived this brief encounter. It was reported to the 352nd Division at 1730 hours in terms of complete annihilation, in which all the senior German officers were killed, wounded, or captured, valuable documents and maps captured, and the survivors pushed south across the river Sul. Well, okay, there's that. But the Germans do manage to capture 151st Brigade Commander Henry Sr. at 445. He's in a jeep visiting his forward units when he runs into an ambush. He's wounded and taken prisoner. He has on him at this time a bunch of marked maps and all of the Allied signal codes for the next two weeks. But guess what? He manages to escape a couple hours from now and makes his way back to safety. I'm not certain if he still has his documents on him or not, but either way, there is no record of the enemy actually making use of them. This is the only actual organized counterattack behind Gold Beach. 
or Omaha Beach for that matter, also in Crisis Sector. Its failure can be attributed to the premature use of the Corps Reserve. Had Generals Marks or Kreis a better intelligence picture of the Allied dispositions during the morning and a little more patience, these battalions would not have had to cycle 40 miles hither and thither before attacking their foes. That's a good point. I mean, what if these guys had hit 50th Division many hours ago while it was fully occupied fighting Le Riviere and Le Amel, the latter of which still has not entirely fallen even now? It could have been another story. I think the Allies got kind of lucky that having their signals codes fall into enemy hands did not turn out to be a big thing. I think so too, but that is the vagaries of war. Hey, how about that Hillman precision? That looks like a pretty serious defense system. It very much is. And here's something special for all of you, so you can get a better idea of just how these underground systems looked and worked. Here's Paul Woodedge and Ryan Sokash and a German bunker. So this is the east end of Omaha Beach, and honestly, other than the beautiful panoramic, the military remnants are less cinematic and impactful than I was really expecting. What would this have looked like in its heyday, and what remains? Well, this is a German Widerstands nest or resistance nest, and there is more than we can see from this particular location, because what the Germans would do is they'd incorporate their bunkers and positions and trenches into whatever there was there existing as best they can to camouflage it. So in front of us, we have two mortar to Brooks for spigot type mortars, probably 81 millimeter that are here because they can see across towards the beach. There's a draw, a valley that they're defending here, mm -hmm. connected by trenches. They can move machine guns. It's kind of more mobile along the trenches there. But down in front of us, which we'll go to in a minute, was a position with a couple of larger caliber weapons, 50 millimeters, 75 millimeters. And what they did here in this particular location at the east end of the beach, is they incorporate those bunkers into an existing French little kind of chalk quarry. So there were okay. already some earthworks and they built into that to hide it as best they can because the Germans know that the Allies will be flying over taking photos of this all through 43, 44. So anything they can do to hide their construction aids their, their secrecy. You know, I'm thinking no matter how strong military might, may have been, standing up here and seeing over 100,000 guys in the water coming your way must have been scary. Was there any documentation as per the emotions or you know, conversations that were held here when that was on the horizon? Not right here, because right here, these Germans were uh, eliminated quite early by a breakthrough off the beach. But further down the beach, a few hundred yards that way, there are some surviving German accounts of people who, who absolutely saw uh, from here, you'd be, uh, be able to see two and a half thousand, maybe three thousand ships coming towards you. And, and the naval power behind that, the bombardment, the aerial bombardment early, it was clearly anything more than they would have possibly imagined as would be coming their direction. Don't forget the German commanders are playing down the Allied strength. Oh, they don't worry, they don't have very much. They're not going to come here with very much. And of course, when they actually see that armada, it would have been uh, incredible. That's an interesting intersection of your ideology being tested by the reality, of yeah. the repercussions of it, yeah. really. Now, I also understand that there weren't only um, ethnic Germans uh, at these bunkers that there was a mix, that there were POWs fighting. That Yeah, it's a very complicated situation. I mean, sort of 40 to 50% of German troops defending the bunkers were, were Ostrupans, so Eastern Europeans of various levels of commitment to the cause, you know, Russian POWs, Poles, Slavs, some of them very committed, some of them less committed, some of them literally looking for an opportunity to run away as soon as they could, and others who are, say, highly motivated, and then the Germans be sat behind them. This particular location where we are now was one of the better more German, German divisions, elements of 352nd Infantry Division here, who are quite an experienced unit, so still quite young guys here, but mostly ethnic Germans here, who would have been pretty motivated to, for, the, for the ideology, yeah. um, although it's kind of a blanket statement to make. Well, when I look at this from today's perspective, you know, it's cold, hard, wet cement. And from what I understand, these types of bunkers were never pretty, they were never comfortable, they were never cosmetic, other than maybe an intimidation factor. And uh, I wondered, did the soldiers feel proud, dignified, in, in something so gross for so long? Well, don't forget, they're, they're not 
living inside these bunkers all the time. For part of their life, they're living in French farms 500 yards away, yeah. coming here on shift work. So they're not living inside the bunkers. And they're part of a mechanism where they're going out on a daily basis and seeing signs up in German and Commandant Tour and headquarters. So they're feeling this is quite a strongly held German presence everywhere. The, the bunker itself may not be the best representation of the occupation, but yeah. they're, they're, they, they are, they're coming here and they're, they're doing a, a shift work and then they're going back having some break in their accommodation. Tell me a little bit more about what would have been positioned here and, and how would the soldier Observe, what was his duty? Well, for a start, the German would never expose himself to being out where we are standing outside. Everything is done internally. Okay. And so inside on these walls here, where you get this octagonal uh, section around here, yeah. they've long since faded away if ever they were here, but they would have uh, oil paintings on these surfaces okay. with all the ranges worked out. So they would know, for example, that there's a position halfway down the beach that is perhaps 2,500 meters away, and they would know that to, to elevate their mortar to have that, hit that position, it would be 4.7 degrees at you know, 217 degrees compass point so and so, so they can instantly refer yeah. to a predetermined range target there. So they rarely have to bring their heads out to see anything. So they're operating it from inside here. The spigot mortar that was here you load the mortar round at the bottom and then turn it and fire it. You're not out the top dropping mortars down the top. Um, the same would be for the artillery piece in the bigger bunkers. They're just working off predetermined data. Yeah. Was there any amenity here in terms of maintaining the soldiers' morale under siege? Um, Maybe some political propaganda slogans. Uh... Yeah, no, absolutely. Some of these bunkers have little slogans. Um, there's one on Utah Beach where the slogan says, every time ready to fire or always ready to fire be a better translation of it. So someone's put that there in sort of German script to kind of motivate the guys. And sometimes mm -hmm. there'd be perhaps some uh, pictures of, of their sweethearts back home and things like that and these patriotic phrases. Well, as far as amenity goes. As far, yeah, as far as that goes. <laughs> Picture of um, your sweetheart, I guess that's the thing that uh, can give you a little motivation to live. Yeah, I mean, for this position here, Vida Stones at 6, there's another set of uh, defenses over there that has more of a kind of an underground situation where you can have maybe six or eight people in there yeah. with some bunk beds some things like that for kind of taking a bit of a break in between duty or to, to hide out when it's raining, things like that. And these have, depending on the, the level of the uh, sophistication of the position, they can have anti-gas defense. Sometimes they have, you know, heating in the winter, even kind of air conditioning in the summer because they've got ventilation coming yeah. through. So it depends how a particular position has been has been built, but they, they could get quite sophisticated with quite some, quite some mod cons. Now, finally, I'm curious, when the Allies came here, made their way up, took these positions, did they utilize the armaments that were left behind? And did they know how to use those? Weapons? Very rarely, no, because um, it's in a fixed line here. Uh, you're now moving in land. To know how to use this is the first hurdle. You've got to work out how to operate it. Then you've got to have the fire information from back here. So frankly, you've got your own weapons, weapons you've, you've, you've served with. So the Americans coming up here would have their own. Uh, 50 millimeter mortars and stuff like that. So they, they would rare, rarely use the enemy weapon. That's kind of a movie trope where the, the guy hero picks up sure. an MP40 and runs with it, but not, not in practice very often. Fascinating. So now we're about to check out the uh, central corridor bunker, as you called it. This was a place that really united the network in a sense, right? Yeah, every every position has to have some sort of central position, the coordination position where supplies are kept, where the officer would have his billets and and there'd be a couple of bunk beds for people to take a kind of a break in here. But this okay. is the one for this position here, Vida Snorzer 60's kind of support, central bunker. Then you can see it's been fortified under the ground, yeah. reinforced concrete above it, all built into the environment with trenches connecting it to the other ones. Well, I've got to say, this is one of those blatant contrast of military and uh, and war, because on one hand, you've got like one of the most beautiful sights I've ever witnessed. And then in front of me, you have this deadly looking dark hole in the ground, you know? Uh, well, welcome to Normandy. That is exactly how we live here. We live with the remnants of World War II, with life goes on. You know, on, on the beaches in the summer, there are people standing there talking about their World War II history, alongside people taking their families to play on the sand. And those two worlds coexist pretty successfully. I've got to say, though, I mean, my very first impression, it's uh, more well-kept than I kind of expected it to be. And uh, 
I don't know if that's the effect of renovation, but it's uh, dry, it's uh, surprisingly intact. Yeah, these ones were, were dug out uh, fairly recently, like five, six years ago. They, they'd been, the entrances had kind of been sealed in and they kind of opened up and made the access into it again. And what they found was pretty much as it was. It had been sealed off the top and it hasn't been, as far as I know, hasn't been cleaned out. It is what we're seeing is how it was left when German soldiers left here on sometime on the afternoon of June the 6th, 44. So tell me, uh, this room, for example, what would we have... What would we have uh, seen in its heyday? A bit of everything, really. I mean, there'd be a couple of bunk beds here for people to take a break in between working while the bunkers or the machine guns. There'd be some uh, a, a map board, perhaps things like that. There's some ammunition stored here. There's, there'd be a steel door, of course, defending the entrance. The steel doors were all taken away after World War II for their scrap value. So we're no, we're no longer seeing the defensive uh, area. Um, they'd always have ventilation, so you can still see the pipe uh, still sitting here that would bring in fresh air. There'd sometimes be a complete compressor unit that pumps fresh air in. If not, there'd just be a vent that brings air in. There'd be boxes, there'd be jerry cans, there'd be, you know, um, electric lights here for the darkness, all these, these kind of things. Basically everything this bunker, this bunker complex would need to support it would be kind of concentrated here. So is there more to it? Yeah, it, uh, it would connect via uh, trenches to the other positions and of course even though it's just really for coordination and storage and uh, this still has its own defense so as we come out the door here we continue up and we'll let you go first you go up to a, a machine gun defensive position probably an older type uh, Polish early machine gun or German 08 machine gun something like that so it can be defended uh, from attack with ammunition recesses here left and right for boxes of ammo. So do you suppose that uh they would have felt any nerves approaching this uh, position when, when action was happening? The Germans would be, in many ways, they'd feel quite confident here because they've been here for months. Their, their superiors have told them this is an you know, uh, impregnable set of defenses. Don't worry, the you know, Fuhrer has got you covered, lads, kind of thing. So they believe everything is going to be set up there. It will change a little bit on the morning of D-Day when they see all those ships coming in. But um, I think generally they're... they're their, their day would have begun feeling more confident, and then as the day progresses, it would have got worse and worse. Yeah. And yet we can enjoy a stunning view. So one of the things I want to talk about here is how the German defensive position as a whole wasn't designed to last very long. It's basically meant to stop the Allies at the water's edge, and hopefully that will be enough. And you can tell that by the fact the ammunition stowage areas aren't very big. You know, some of the German machine guns can fire up to you know 1,200 rounds per minute, and if you imagine box ammunition there, they, you've got a few minutes worth there. So, essentially, Rommel's plan was that the Allies would be halted at the water's edge. The Allies would fail at that first moment there, and it, they, these positions wouldn't need to have very much ammunition because that first wave would just be halted. What happened universally across the beaches is the first wave often experienced heavy losses, but the second wave arrived 10 minutes later, and then a third wave 10 minutes after that. And once the Allies started putting so many men ashore, often these positions ran out of ammunition before they ran out of, uh, of, of will, so to speak. If they simply haven't got any am more ammunition for their guns to keep on firing, you'll see that on certain other positions where the Germans just no, have no rounds left to fire. So, Would the Germans surrender in that situation? Uh, surrender or, or, or move to handheld. You know, they've got rifles as well and kind of hold on there. So the German defences seems to be very strong, but it's in many ways a kind of a paper-thin facade that is dependent on the on it working in those first few moments. And, and what happened is it didn't work in those first few moments. You have these two kind of levels of combat going on at the same time. You have the massive great naval guns engaging with their eight inch shells on a large level, firing over the top and helping to reduce these positions. And at the same moment, you might have two GIs running up a, a gully and attacking two Germans in a machine gun position where it is almost hand to hand uh, combat. Perhaps if the Germans had fought in the Eastern Front where some of them had, they would have a, maybe a, a sharpened edge to their entrenching tool for that kind of close combat. I'm not saying that did necessarily happen, but that those sort of small en engagements definitely happened on D-Day as it got very, very, very intense in some of the, some of the locations. Can you paint the picture for me as to how this beach would have looked from the perspective of this bunker on D-Day? 
So this, this is part of a German Widerstandsnest, so a resistance nest, so it's a complex of bunkers. On each beach, the Germans did what they could to incorporate those bunkers into the environment that happens to be there naturally. So here clearly is an urban environment. So there are mortars hidden in effectively the basements and gardens of houses, trenches dug through back gardens. And here, the bunk has been incorporated into the existing seawalls. So this wall was always here. But running along that seawall, was huge tangles of barbed wire to stop the Allies getting off it, which is why the, uh, the, the Canadian force mostly didn't land on this stretch of beach ahead of us. They landed behind us. So they're not in the field of fire of this gun. And what's interesting about this gun is this five centimeter pack can turn and rotate towards me and then down the beach looking into the camera there. It can also face up the street there up down the street there and over that way. It's got about 270 degrees field of fire, so they've chosen to locate it here. But because the Allies have an incredible amount of knowledge, they've got aerial photos, they've got information from the French, what they're able to do is plot the very worst parts of the beach and try and bring the forces in around that. So what they're doing is, is they're coming in around the side and attacking from behind here and taking out from the rear. So we've visited some of the bunkers along the coastline, which were rather standalone, isolated feeling. This, in contrast, is sprawling, damp, it's a bit of a maze. What is the difference? Simply because we're at the next level of sophistication. The, the beach defenses are um, smaller, the bunkers have trenches between, but now we're talking about a major artillery position to deal with the threat of a Navy, an sort of Allied invasion coming in. So the Germans are now creating a city underground. So, okay, yeah, we're seeing it when it's a bit damp and a bit nasty to walk into. But at the time, you're talking about a thriving city where 170 Germans are living in this complex at any one time. So there's electric lighting and there's, you know, maybe music playing out through the, the system here. And these tunnels are the means of moving from the storage areas to the ammunition areas to the bunkers, all safe from any potential Allied air, air, air bombardment. So we're at the next level of sophistication here. And I'll be honest with you, as a visitor, I could imagine that this feels a degree safer because there's actually another place underground where you could escape to. Yeah, and the very fact we're in it here and walking through it, and we know this area was heavily bombed before D-Day and on D-Day, is the fact that it obviously didn't do much damage because we're here. There was some damage to this site, but really this type of defense keeps it not 100% protected from the Allied invasion, but you know, to a point where you can be confident that you're not gonna get uh, interrupted here. But tell me, how would this compare to modern technology? Well, modern technology is very different because shells have that much more sophistication with various levels of explosives and penetrating things or hollow charge and things like that. And I expect these days it would be fairly easy to, to, to destroy this. But the, with World War II bombing, essentially dropping big lumps of metal out of aircraft from a head, uh, 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 overhead, it's, it's not going to really make much difference. And we know that by the fact we're in it uh, 78 years on without that damage being visible. We've just been going through about 200 yards of rather simple but still pretty cool tunnels where we have to crouch to go through, but we're getting further into the Asville battery. So come with me now as we go into the next level of underground storage and ammunition areas. Just when I thought it couldn't get bigger, we've descended underground. Tell me, how did this sprawling complex come to be? Well, the Germans occupy Normandy in 1940, so Rommel's 5th Army come up here and occupy this area. Up until that moment, though, there was no construction here. The construction of these defences didn't even begin for two years. 1942, things have turned very sour on the Eastern Front. We know that Barbarossa starts failing, etc., etc. Then the Germans begin to think about defending on the Western side of, the, of Europe what they'd already seized and that's when the construction of the Atlantic War begins and what the Germans are doing is they're looking for really good geographical areas where they can have a battery that has good vision, good, good support network, plenty of locals to have to help with labour and things like that and that's why Asville where we are now was uh, chosen because it overlooks the beach 
and it's near the main roads towards Cherbourg, which of course being a deep water harbour is something the Germans really want to defend because of the previous experience of Dieppe in August 1942, Operation Jubilee. So they know the Allies are going to want to need a harbour. So set up those defences to keep a harbour safe. And that's where Asville starts coming into the story. How much did the Allies know about this complex? How did they gather the information that they did know? And were they fearful of this place? They did have information. The majority of the information is going to be aerial photos. And the problem with aerial photos is they cannot penetrate below the level of the ground. You can understand there's a bunker there, there's a bunker there, there's a bunker there. There's a limited amount of information coming from the French resistance, but that is only going to be French people who are allowed within the construction sites because the Germans aren't stupid. They're not going to let every Tom, Dick and Harry from 20 miles away near what is going to be a very secret location. So the workers that are allowed in here who might not even be from Normandy, they might be brought in from Poland or somewhere else, how much information can they relay to the resistance to get back to Allies? So the Allies had information, but often with these big fortifications, they had misunderstood how strong they were below the ground. And we know that sites like this, Asville, uh, there's Mayerville in the British sector, Crisbeck is another one, Long Mare. Generally, though they were bombed before D-Day and on D-Day, the damage was not what the Allies had hoped. They were mostly still able to fire on D-Day, mostly still operational. This one itself wasn't liberated till June the 9th, troops from Utah Beach, so they provided big defensive positions for the Germans to set up in, and that's what you have here at places like Asville. I'm not surprised at all. This place is big and it is brutal. So here within the quarters, you start to come upon an interesting contrast. In reference to this photo where the people who were housed here had personal artifacts and were probably trying to cling to some sentiment of humanity, yet they were waiting for a time that either horrific things would happen to them or they would have to do horrific things to others. Walk me through that sentiment and a day in the life. Well, the first thing I want to say is I don't think they feel that what's looming is going to be disastrous. They think they're confident, the ideology they've been they've bought into, even if they're not loyal Nazis, is the German war machine is still functioning, it's still brilliant. These defences are amazing, they're, they're safe here, they're underground, they've got air conditioning in almost in the summer, they've got heating in the winter, they've got food on site, they've got canteens, they've got leave every now and then to go up to Cherbourg and, and, and see women and have a few beers. So I think they're sitting here supremely confident that they're in a place like this. It's either here or the Russian front, where would I rather be? Right here. So they're getting up and they're living on site preparing for something that's happening. But I think until the morning of D-Day and there they start receiving that bombardment, they are supremely confident that they are part of a mechanism that is going to thwart this invasion completely. So with that in mind, I'd have to kind of retract what I said earlier because it would seem that humanity was absolutely lost if people in this condition could actually believe that they stand a chance of a positive future. This is amazing, it's like on the scale of industrial decay. What kind of armaments were held here? So this is where one of the French 105 millimeter uh, gun sets at here that can fire 12 kilometers, so eight or nine miles. And the fact is we don't need to be able to see the beach from here because this is using information coming in from a fire observation position a couple of miles away at Crisbeck. So they're being told what to do by telephone. And if the telephone doesn't work by runners and signalers and what have you, and then they just simply turn to a pre uh, determined elevation and, uh, and bearing and they can fire the target. So massive guns and firing it here was just horrible. The vacuum created when this gun fires, you, know, you have to have ventilation behind it. And these guys are essentially not, they're not trained monkeys, but they're not the tech. They're, they're not the clever part of the tech. The clever part of the technology is the observation elsewhere. These guys are just following what they've been told to do to fire on a target elsewhere. Which leads me to wonder if one party is a, inside of a fire observation tower, the others are here and this bunker is huge. I imagine they had to 
communicate with one another? How was that done? Well, this is the, one of the things that became a factor for the Germans on D-Day is often the Allies had not damaged the bunkers, but they had taken out communications. And so there's uh, limited telephone lines operating between the various positions. The runners start getting killed as they go out. Telephone lines get broken. And often it was the failure to communicate between bunkers that lets the Germans down. The gun itself is still operable. The crew are still there, but they don't have the fire orders coming out. So there is a system to communicate, but it's not perfect. It is certainly not perfect when along this coast over there behind Utah, you know, 300 medium bombers fly down the morning of D-Day dropping you know, hundreds of tons of bombs, and that takes out some of the communication. So yeah, communication they thought was perfect here, but it ended up being imperfect. This is one of the larger complexes that I visited, and it makes me wonder, what do you believe it represents in terms of the Nazis' overall scale? Well, it's folly. I mean, it's all this money into something that didn't work. I mean, that, that's the thing, is that you can argue the merits of the Tiger Tank and the Stuka and the Messerschmitt, this, that, and that, but this Atlantic Wall project that ran from the coast of Norway right down to the border with, you know, with Spain didn't work. It barely delayed the Allies for the first few hours of morning of D-Day. So all these thousands of tons of concrete, all this steel, all these hundreds, thousands of workers, they are part of something that basically fails, and it fails on the first day it was ever used. Well, I've got to say, standing here in a free France and in the free part of the world, I'm sure as hell glad that it failed. Failing it may be, but in the American zone, there is still fighting going on in and near several coastal villages. Robert Cole's small group has held out at saint marie du monts church, for other than the occasional German patrols at the outskirts of the village, there has been no direct threat to their position. Well, until the first heavy shells suddenly hit the ancient stone walls. Like all church steeples in the area, these formidable observation posts are prime targets for the artillery and mortar of both sides. Under enormous explosions, Cole and his men quickly scramble down as the upper part of the church begins crumbling around them. As they reach the ground, they suddenly hear the sound of armor approaching. An American tank comes rumbling through the bushes, but this was not the culprit of the shelling. They soon find out it came from Oldi. But wait, that's the place where the paratroopers of the 506 neutralized the German artillery. Now the Americans, it seems, are using the captured howitzers, and it is they who have shelled the church steeple here, thinking it is being used by German observers. Such incidents of friendly fire between the outfits are not uncommon. In the early afternoon, Task Force RAF enjoys a rather uneventful journey. The 17 Shermans and four six-wheel Greyhounds only encounter dead or captive Germans along the busy roads. Once they make their way off the causeways, they follow the road for three miles until they reach a junction called Le Forge. From here, they can see the high church steeple of saint Marie's, or what's left of its smoldering top. Since the Germans have made no effort to block Le Forge, Raff decides to keep the momentum going and directs his small armored column northwards. Then the road begins to slope downward, descending into a valley with overgrown ridges on either side. This is a great place for an ambush. And that is just what happens. Three tanks are lost in the blink of an eye before they can line up and respond. The German commander on top of that ridge is no fool and knows that he holds a strong position. With a direct assault out of the question, Raff orders his men to change gears and reverse out of range of the enemy anti-tank guns. It is not going to be easy to get to San Mereglis. 115th Regimental Headquarters has been down on the beach since landing at Easy Red, but about 4.30, they head up the E1 draw towards Saint Laurent. I said this morning that WN 66 and 67 protect that draw. 66 does fall to the attackers this afternoon, but 67, on the western side, will remain in German hands for several more hours. The village itself will end the day still in German hands, though at 6 p.m., an American company will reach the center of town but will be driven off. There's something else we see this hour, though, inland. We see more Allied bombing of German-occupied targets. At about 4.30 p.m., the citizens of Khan are bombed again. 
This time, though, it is the medium bombers of the 9th Air Force that do the job. The attack on Caen is just one of a series of strikes this afternoon carried out by a total of 225 B-26 Marauders and 130 A-20 Havocs. These aircraft drop over 400 tons of bombs on four coastal batteries, six road junctions, and four bridges in and around Norman towns. All of a sudden, someone yelled out, Planes are diving! Quick, everyone inside! We had enough time to catch a glimpse of the planes. They had a white star on the fuselage and a strange tail with two rudders shaped like plates, which were connected to the elevator. The planes flew at low altitude, and there was a strident whistling noise as they passed over our heads. But they didn't shoot. We rushed into the trench. Phew! It couldn't have come sooner. We had barely gotten to safety when all hell broke loose. Terrorized little children began to scream as the machine guns tore up the area above us. The planes were turned to attack, one after another. They swooped down on us and fired continuously. One woman was screaming as the children around her sobbed. I wondered when the infernal racket would finally end. It was the lowest the planes had ever flown. We had the horrifying impression that they were targeting us that we already had one foot in the grave and our only option was to sit and wait. What did they all want from us? I wanted to rise up in revolt against whom I did not know. I felt like crying out, this is your great liberation? We are all meant to get our share? Our world was calm before you arrived. Perhaps it wasn't terrific, but at least we had a chance to make it out in one piece. Whereas now? The sound was enough to drive one mad if only the kids would stop their wailing and their mother, Mercy. She should shut her mouth, yelled Colette, who had limited herself to plaintive sighs up until that point. I was relieved that my sister was brave enough to bring the woman into line. You have to pull yourself together. It was hard to believe, but we didn't hear any more noise outside. We listened closely, silence. At last, it was over. Everyone in the trench calmed down as well. Someone next to us abruptly started laughing uncontrollably. It was a strange, wild guffa. We were all on edge, but alive. Also, 37 Marauder bombers attacked the German battery at Mont Canessy with 61 tons of bombs this hour. As D-Day drew near, the Allied air marshals did really carefully watch the skies over the North Sea and the English Channel. The great air offensive into Germany was in full swing, and the Luftwaffe is seemingly on the brink of destruction. Yet they are not out of the count yet. The same goes for the strong German batteries and mobile reserves on the ground, which could wreak havoc on a tightly packed landing force. So, if the Allies want to achieve success on D-Day, they need to utilize their strongest assets, planes that spit fire and move like lightning. There are few aircraft more iconic than the Vickers Supermarine Spitfire. The sleekness of its wings, the distinct sound of its engine, the whole design has, by now, become the embodiment of wartime Britain. But back in the early 1930s, it seemed like the Royal Air Force was fast asleep, dreaming of the glory of bygone days of agile little biplanes with Vickers machine guns. And the sudden power surge of the German Luftwaffe was a rude awakening. Reports about the new aircraft coming from the likes of Messerschmitt, focke Wolf, and Junkers led to the British Air Ministry issuing specification F-1035, the urgent need for a powerful new fighter with excellent speed and maneuverability. The engineers at Supermarine headquarters felt confident they could deliver exactly that and more. By March 1936, they presented their first working prototype, K-5054, which was soon to be called Spitfire Mark I. The Spitfire's oval platform wings, which resemble a leaf shape, seemed to embody aerodynamic perfection. They were also very light, with the engineers trying to keep the wings as thin as possible while still being able to house four machine guns. Outfitted with a two-blade propeller and an ultra-smooth paint job, the first Spitfires could reach a top speed of 560 kilometers per hour. This was also because of another technical masterpiece coming from the British Isles, the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Originally, it was designed for the Wellington bomber, but seemed inadequate for high-altitude fighters since it lost efficiency fairly quickly at higher altitudes. But once Rolls-Royce engineers found that a coolant made out of pure ethylene glycol 
would still boil at 120 Celsius at 8,230 meters. It gave fighter planes like Spitfires massive boost in speed and acceleration. The Royal Air ordered their first batch of 300 Mark Ones to upgrade their outfit. However, there was a downside to innovation. The Spitfire's revolutionary design seemed just too complicated to produce. In fact, the Germans could build three ME 109s in the same time it took the British to make one Spitfire. In September 1939, when Messerschmitt put out more than 100 ME 109s, Supermarine made just over 30 Spitfires. Many in general in the Air Ministry thought the Spitfire didn't have much of a future because no matter how good it was, if the Germans could really outproduce them, then it was simply not worth it. And truly, there were no initial plans to continue the Spitfire beyond the Mark I. But the outbreak of the war with Germany quickly turned that around. With the Isles under increasing air attacks by the Luftwaffe, the RAF had no choice but to use what they had at hand. And the small force of some 300 Spitfires that was available quickly proved their worth. Pilots immediately noticed the versatility of the Spitfire's slender wings, which allowed for such incredibly tight turns that pilots could even suffer blackouts from the heavy G-force. The elliptical wings allowed for a rapid climb rate, while at the same time lowering stall speed. And unlike other contemporary aircraft, the wings react when the Spitfire is about to go into a stall. A noticeable wobble alarms the pilot and gives him a chance to pull out in time. Together with perfectly harmonized controls, this fighter offered an excellent compromise between maneuverability and steadiness for shooting down German bombers. By the time of the Battle of Britain, though, the Spitfire was not the unchallenged champion of the skies. But although the German ME-109 was the quicker plane, a faster diver with more firepower, it had a hard time dealing with the Spitfire's ability to make ultra-tight turns in a dogfight. Still, to not fall behind, Supermarine called in supreme urgency, and its workers put in 15-hour shifts to bring the Spit to the next level. New exhaust pipes gave a boost to its speed, and with engine heat diverted into the wings, it prevented the now eight machine guns from freezing at high altitudes. There was a simple rearview mirror to help escape the Germans on their tails, as well as a thicker windscreen glass to reduce injuries from frontal attacks. The fuel tank was covered by an alloy cover, and additional armor plating was added to the rear of the pilot seat. But maybe the biggest improvement in performance was achieved by switching out the Spitfire's propeller. The original two-speed propeller was removed, and the new Mark II was upgraded with a constant-speed propeller. This allowed for even greater maneuverability, as well as a stronger climb and a higher ceiling. The new propeller also reduced the takeoff distance required by 25%, and reduced the climb rate to 6,000 meters from 11 minutes to 8. Another big help was the arrival of better fuel from the U.S. The new 100-octane was way superior to the previous 87 octane fuel. This not only increased the Spitfire's overall acceleration, but also gave the pilot an emergency boost system. When the need for speed arose, the pilot could push a red thumb lever to override the engine's boost control and inject extra fuel into the system. A short-term rush of an extra 58 kilometers per hour was the reward. Of course, it had to be used sparingly to preserve the engine's life, but you know, that's pretty cool. The Germans weren't sleeping, of course, and their new Messerschmitt BF-109E was a tough opponent. But another major step forward for the British came with the introduction of the Mark V in 1941, which was equipped with the updated Rolls-Royce Merlin 45 engine. The Mark V came with several modifications and variations. Some Spitfires were now equipped with 20mm cannons, others with a bomb rack. Some had their wings clipped, others theirs expanded, depending if they were to fight in low or high altitude operations. By the time of D-Day, the Spitfire has evolved from a symbol of resistance and defiance to the old workhorse of the Empire. Thousands are now deployed all over the globe, flown not only by British pilots, but by pilots from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, as well as Belgian, Dutch, French, Norwegian, Czech, Polish pilots. As June 1944 has drawn closer, it is the Mark IX that provides the ultimate Spitfire experience. The new Rolls-Royce Merlin 63 V12 engine is able to pump out 1,690 horsepowers 
and a new four-bladed propeller gives the Spitfire its best possible performance. With a top speed of 657 kilometers per hour at 7,620 meters, the Spitfire can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the German Focke Wolf FW190 and compete with the new planes coming from the US. Once the weather improves over Normandy, it is the task of the 2nd Tactical Air Force of Airfield Number 125 to provide direct support to the invading forces and keep the skies clear of enemy interceptors. They do and will accompany bombers into the lowlands, attacking railway junctions and airfields. In the absence of Luftwaffe fighters, they themselves undertake rhubarb missions, attacking ground targets like V-1 installations, anti-aircraft positions, and trains. It was 1940 when the Royal Air Force undertook retaliation strikes and bombing raids against occupied Europe. But losses among bomber crews were heavy, and Britain could hardly afford to assign any more Spitfires to escort duty. So, in need of reinforcements, but with their own aircraft industry working at their limits, the British looked towards American manufacturers for help. Many American entrepreneurs saw the war in Europe as a major business opportunity, and one of the most ambitious ones was the head designer of the North American aviation company, Ed Schmood. He and his engineers were eager to get their hands on the first combat reports from the Battle of Britain and channel those experiences into their new prototype, the NA-73. Like the Spitfire, the NA-73's design was quite innovative. A laminar flow airfoil built around a sleek, all-metal, stressed skin airframe was to become the main characteristic of the new plane soon known as the Mustang. A second major selling point was its range. Since the Mustang stored its fuel inside two self-sealing tanks inboard the wings, its capacity was 180 US gallons, 681 liters, which was nearly twice the amount of the Spitfire. Soon, NA brokered a deal to send Britain a total of 620 of their new planes. Now, although the US was neutral, North American Aviation was a private company, and as long as the German-born Schmood did not raise the suspicions of the American security offices or give the US Army Air Corps a reason to block his aircraft sales to a foreign power, this was fine. But the Royal Air Force did lay down some specifications. First, the Mustang had to be built with a liquid-cooled inline engine. The only one available in the U.S. at that time was the Allison V-1710, which was a little heavier and larger than the Merlin, but similar in power output. Second, the British needed significant firepower, so the Mustang Mark I was armed with two .50 caliber Browning machine guns in the underside of the nose, synchronized to fire through the propeller. Another two were mounted in the wings outboard of the landing gear. Four additional 30 caliber guns were set further outboard on the wings. The first tests of the designated British prototype NA-73X showed the plane worked rather well with the engine and the heavy weight of the guns. It was almost 40 kilometers per hour faster than the contemporary P-40. The Mustang's laminar flow airfoils were a bit problematic at first, as while they produce less drag at high speed, they produce less lift at low speeds, which made landings rather difficult. So North American's engineers had to extend the flaps and add straight spars to the wings to stabilize the fast aircraft. By July 1942, all 620 Mustangs had been successfully shipped over to Britain. By then, though, the battle for Britain had been decided, at least in the air, so the Mustang was mostly deployed for cross-channel sweeps against German trains, supply depots, and other targets of opportunity. There are many historians that consider the Mustang the best American-made fighter plane of the war. It is faster than the Spitfire at an altitude below 7,600 meters and has twice the range with the larger fuel tanks. Fully loaded, the Mustang can reach a top speed of 595 kilometers per hour at 4,570 meters at a cruising speed of 290. This gives a maximum range of just under 1,600 kilometers. However, they are by no means perfect. The Mustang's performance drops sharply at altitudes above 4,600 meters. Where the Mustang needs 11 minutes to climb to 6,000 meters, the Spitfire 5 can reach that in seven. And once up there, 
Both the Spitfire and the ME109 are superior in agility and turning speed. This sharp decline in performance is mostly from the Mustang's Allison engine, as well as its heavy weight, which is a third more than that of the Spitfire. For those reasons, the RAF employs the Mustang mostly in low-level tactical reconnaissance and ground attack missions, since the supercharged Allison engine really excels in these roles. Of course, it isn't just the Brits that are interested in the Mustang. When the U.S. enters the war, Air Chief Hap Arnold orders 500 NA-97 Mustangs right off the bat. He intends to use them as dive bombers. Although technically not designed for that role, the redesignated Mustang A-36A turns out to be a good fit for the job. Outfitted with perforated dive brakes, it can keep diving speeds down to 400 kilometers an hour, even with attacks starting from up to 3,700 meters, and still have excellent dive recovery ability. With the war widening in all directions, North American also wants to cover the U.S. fighter plane market as well. Initially, only the Bell P-39D Era Cobra and the Curtis Wright P-40E Warhawk are available in quantity. So NA's newest Mustang XP-51 version is equipped with the devastating firepower of 850 caliber and 230 caliber machine guns. Still... In the U.S., they get some real competition. There is also Northrop, Lockheed, Bell Aircraft, Volte, Republic, and others who all make prototype designs hoping to land the lucrative contract. The Mustang's strongest competition comes from the turbocharged Lockheed P-38 Lightning and the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt. The P-47 has even more firepower and better survivability and its air-cooled engine is more reliable, especially in the heat of combat, yet many American pilots find the Mustang to be the better plane. Its main asset, the laminar flow airfoil, is very efficient at reducing peak airflow velocities over the wings and minimizes the compressibility effects that impede many fighter aircraft at the time. With its flexibility to be used as both a long-range fighter escort and a ground attack plane, the U.S. Army Air Forces put their hopes in the Mustang. It's the NA-99, which becomes the P-51A in August 1942, and the P-51B by the end of 1943. As part of the U.S. 8th Air Force, the Mustang escorts heavy bombers into France and deep into Germany, and there are many large and small changes and alterations to the P-51 over the years. The P-51D, the newest version on D-Day, reaches a maximum speed of just over 700 kilometers per hour and has a max range of 2,655 kilometers. That is 800 kilometers more than a return trip from London to Berlin. This is because of its marriage with the British Merlin 61 engine, which boosts overall performance. At low altitudes, the Mustang now outmatches pretty much everything the Luftwaffe can put into the air. For D-Day and the air offensive into Germany, U.S. Fighter Command has assembled nearly a thousand Mustangs. Their main job today is to cover bombers against Luftwaffe interceptors while they sweep over the shore defenses. After that, the Mustangs are free to execute tactical airstrikes against German troop concentrations. And no matter where the Luftwaffe retires to, they can pursue them all the way to Germany and beyond if need be. The Mustang is not the only Allied attack plane with long-range and heavy firepower. One of the Mustang's biggest competitors is the Lockheed P-38 Lightning, and this plane's combat history is as interesting as its design. The P-38 is known as the Fork-Tailed Devil because it has not one, but two water-cooled 16-cylinder inline engines. Supercharged, the two Allison V-1710s put the Lightning at the top of the list of the fastest fighters in the world. Its hydraulic boosted ailerons allow for power steering and immense acceleration during flight. It is also the first American fighter plane with a smooth, flush riveted metal skin. Its birthplace is the skunk works at Lockheed that responded to the U.S. Army Air Force's call for a powerful new interceptor. Back in 1937, as the war between Japan and China heated up, there was a rising fear in the U.S. that they would be vulnerable to attacks from long-range bombers. 
To combat this possibility, the top brass laid out some specifications. They wanted an interceptor able to climb to 6,000 meters in six minutes. In the late 1930s, that was a serious demand. But Lockheed successfully created the P-322, which was soon nicknamed the Lightning by the British, who showed interest in acquiring the plane. However, there were many problems and shortcomings plaguing the first models. The planes had a power to weight problem that became really apparent at higher altitudes in the cold climate of Northern Europe. There was also, strangely enough, a real lack of automization and pilot comfort. Strange, given that the P-38 is designed as a long range plane. In the US, it isn't until mid-1942 that the Lightning is deployed in combat. In its intended role, the Lightning is sent out to the Pacific Theater to combat the Japanese invasion of the Aleutian Islands. In general, the Lightning still performs much better in warmer climates, and its long range makes it a popular over-ocean aircraft. The two engines also give the pilots a feeling of safety. The P-38 has its heyday at Guadalcanal and over the Solomons and Rabaul, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best Japanese aircraft. It is the plane's superior acceleration that gives it the upper hand in dogfights and can quickly turn the hunted into the hunter. Its counter-rotating propellers allow for the P-38 to make tight turns, unexpected in such a large fighter. Famous is, of course, the in-air assassination of Isoroku Yamamoto, commander of the Japanese Combined Fleet. After flying 700 kilometers at wave-top height, a group of lightnings leap skyward and kill the most influential man in the Japanese Navy inside his plane. The lightning's firepower is truly devastating. Four 50 caliber machine guns patterned around a Hispano M1 20 millimeter cannon in the nose of the plane. These five guns are set in a tight circumference the size of a football, and they just shred any plane that they hit. The P-38 also has enough weight capacity to carry up to 2,000 kilos of bombs. This makes the Lightning a strong contender for the US AAF's primary fighter. If it wasn't for the many flaws that haunt it, like the compressibility stall. See, sometimes when the pilot puts the Lightning into a very steep dive at high speed, the flight controls just lock up. Nothing can be done at this point, and sometimes it becomes so severe that the whole tail structure rips apart. Another flaw is the asymmetric power defect. This can happen on the runway, when suddenly one of the two engines stops and the P-38 flips over at full speed with disastrous consequences. These flaws overshadow the Lightning's great potential. Lockheed's engineers continuously work to solve the problems and make countless modifications to the P-38's design. The P-38J is maybe the best possible version of the Lightning. Lockheed boasts that nothing the Germans or Japanese have in their arsenals other than maybe experimental fighters like the ME-163 would come even close to competing with its speed and diving and climbing ability. Outfitted with a refined aileron boost, new compressibility dampening flaps, and the latest version of the Allison V-1710, the Lightning can produce 1,475 horsepowers at 9,100 meters. The modified P-38J25 can even reach a top speed of more than 675 kilometers per hour. Problem is, the P-38J is not ready in large numbers until this spring, and anyhow, with the massive Allied aerial advantage over the Luftwaffe and the Japanese, does the US AAF really need interceptors? This day may well be the last hurrah of the lightning as the world turns in favor of the Mustang. I suppose we'll see about that as the summer rolls on. But the day is rolling on and there are new developments. This hour, the electricity is restored in some parts of northern France, and the official news of the invasion and its scope reaches the French general public. But in terms of local developments, at 4.54 p.m., Rommel orders the immediate subordination of Panzerlea Division to 1st SS Panzerkorps and the immediate deployment of the 21st Panzer Division for counterattack. Speidel passes down the order to attack immediately without regard for arrival of reinforcements. I wonder how long it'll take for them to really get going. 
Oh, I imagine we'll find out soon enough. But we have De Gaulle's speech, some serious explosives, and a close-up of a battle in the Bocage when we return with Hour 18 of D-Day. <laughs> 